Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you to the Sydney Foundation for this incredible honor. It is beyond humbling to have this work recognized in this way. And I'm deeply appreciative to you and the people of Australia for this recognition. So thank you. Oh. Almost 15 years ago, I tried to not do a thing and failed. <laughs> I know that sounds a little ominous, so I will explain. Um, I'm the product of a family that was incredibly socially conscious. My grandfather strongly believed that it was imperative that I know my history as a black person in America. So he insisted on me reading scholarly texts about the contributions of Africans in the world and the origins of Africans in America while I was still in junior high school. And my mother wrapped me in black feminist literature from a very early age. So I was sort of reared loving the likes of Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Nikki Giovanni before I read a word of Shakespeare. The wealth of information my family imparted um, with me made me smart and curious, and it also helped me to be able to identify injustice when I saw it. I could call it out and talk about it, but the information I got from my family didn't give me the tools to really do anything about it. That changed when I turned 14 years old and I joined an organization called the 21st Century Youth Leadership Movement. 21st Century, as it's called, was founded by veterans of the civil rights and black power and labor movements and other movements of the 60s and 70s in America. The mission of the organization was to produce a new generation of grassroots community organizers who could carry on their legacy of work. They gave me the tools to do something about all of the injustice that I could only call out previously. So I was a different sort of kid. I had the privilege of knowing very early on that I wanted to be in service of my community and others pushed to the margins before I was even out of high school. And as a consequence of having had made up my mind so early in life, it meant that I often found myself wandering into and then welcoming new fights. Racism, police brutality, sweatshops, fair housing, grassroots political organizing, you name it. I was to be a part of it. My friends jokingly call me the uh, Forrest Gump of social justice, but <laughs> I don't think that's funny. But I felt called to do so. I felt that call as an organizer in college. I felt it when I finished college and joined the 21st century staff to train other youth leaders. And I felt it when I started an organization called Just Be Inc. that was dedicated to the health and wholeness of young women of color. Each and every time I felt that call, there was never a question in my mind whether I would answer it. It felt like my duty. But when the call came in my spirit to do something about the rampant sexual violence that I was witnessing in the lives of the young girls in my community, I didn't want to answer. I knew that answering this particular call meant dredging up a part of myself that I had carefully and neatly locked in a box and put high on a shelf. I knew it meant facing the kind of fear and shame and guilt that no reasonable person would invite into their lives. So I knew it would require a kind of courage that I was often accused of, but never quite had to walk in with both feet. But it was the venerable poet, author, and wise maven, Dr. Maya Angelou, who once said, courage is the most important of all virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. So as much as I didn't want to embark on this work when it was put in my spirit to do so, I failed at resisting this call. And that same courage that I had to muster up to partake in this work, is the courage that compelled so many survivors from all walks of life with any number of experiences to come forward two years ago using the hashtag MeToo. In 2017, the viral MeToo hashtag magnified the prevalence of sexual violence across the globe 
and across identities, economic status, religions, disabilities, and more. As a result, what started as a very local grassroots Me Too movement has grown into an international survivor-led community working to highlight the breadth and depth of sexual violence and to support survivors' pathways to healing while addressing the gaps and barriers in resources for survivors and galvanizing a broad base of survivors to disrupt the systems that uphold the global prolifer proliferation of sexual violence. The Me Too movement is fueled by the idea of empowerment through empathy and courageous community action. In short, we are a movement about healing and action. I almost lost my place, y'all. Hold on a minute. <laughs> this is technology. I'm often asked if I'm surprised by the widespread growth of the movement since the viral hashtag. And my answer is always the same. I am not. In the US, one in four girls and one in six boys will experience sexual violence by the time they reach 18. In Australia, that number is one in six girls and one in nine boys by the age of 15. And around the world, those numbers are about the same. Most of those children grow up to be adults who still carry those wounds. And if you manage to make it out of childhood without experiencing some form of sexual violence, statistics show us there are several more instances where it is likely to occur as you grow along, especially if you're a woman especially if you're a poor woman, especially if you are a poor woman of color, or queer, or trans, or disabled, or indigenous. I'm not surprised because sexual violence can affect everyone. And because it is extremely isolating, we crave community as survivors. And that is what the hashtag gave us, space to be seen and heard and create community. So how did a, a moment that was so desperately needed in order to boost a movement that is so desperately needed for people who have already experienced a spectrum of trauma get reduced to a witch hunt? I keep coming back to the idea of empathy and courage because both of them are at the core of what is needed for us to adequately respond to the millions of people who so bravely came forward. This movement is not about creating a witch hunt or targeting powerful men or women's revenge. And what does it say about the person who can witness the outpouring of stories across the world and reduce it to women's histrionics or faux outrage? I've taken up too much time already. I knew I was going to, so I wrote it in my speech. <laughs> but I don't want to leave Australia without driving home the message that the Me Too movement is bigger than what so many of us think. When a singular hashtag inspires more than 180 countries to translate it into their own language and country, countries like China to even find ways to add their voices to the chorus, you are talking about a movement about possibility. When thousands of people join together to put their bodies on the line, marching and protesting to say that they won't stand for sexual predators, predators to take and be in positions that will make decisions about our bodies, we are talking about a movement about power. When an 83-year-old survivor of sexual abuse feels supported enough to come forward and finally release the story that she's been holding in the pit of her stomach for 75 years, we are talking about a movement about love. And when a little black girl from the Bronx makes up her mind that she will not be consumed by the thing that tried to kill her every day of her life, but she will turn that pain into a pathway to healing and action for others like her. We are talking about a movement about vision. I am grateful that this work is being recognized as peace work by the Sydney Peace Foundation. 
I hope others will see that the work of ensuring that future generations can live without violence, particularly sexual violence, is social justice work, and it is peace work. We are not out here working to simply raise awareness. There is enough data and stories and information to make everyone aware. And as the brilliant author and scholar Dr. Imani Perry says, awareness in and of itself is not a virtue without a moral imperative. This is our moral imperative. I hope each of you carries that message with you when you leave here and know that this movement doesn't exist without you. So I urge you to join us. And if you are ready to stand with survivors and allies around the world, don't worry if you don't know where to start. Don't worry if your hands tremble a little bit. There are enough of us out here to welcome you, guide you, and help you find your place. So if you are ready to join this fight to end sexual violence and ensure that survivors have what they need to craft their own healing journey, I can only leave you with these two words. Me too. Thank you. Thank you.